Hi, I'm here for an interview. Oh, yes. Come in. What's your expertise in? Graph networks. The Messiah. You've returned. Hello world, it's Siraj, and graph neural networks are starting to get really popular in the AI community because of their unique ability to learn from graph data efficiently. In this episode, I'm going to show you how they work, how they're being used to solve real world problems, and how you can build your own today in a few lines of Python code. In computer science, a graph is a data structure that consists of both edges and vertices. We can define a graph mathematically as an equation, or we can define it visually using dots and lines. Doing this helps us better interpret the graph data that lives all around us. For example, any kind of transportation system can be thought of as a graph, with locations as vertices and connections as edges. Or a molecule, its atoms are vertices and its chemical bonds are the edges. Or a social network, where the humans are the vertices and their relationships are the edges. Unless you're like me, forever alone. But that's not the point. The point is that algorithms that could learn from these complex connections and understand not just the direct, but the indirect relationships that we humans would never think to look for would be valuable, right? The canonical machine learning algorithm that probably first comes to mind to use here would be a neural network. But in order for a neural network to be able to process this graph data, we need to format the graph data to be in a certain matrix-like format, more formally called a tensor. A tensor is an n-dimensional array, and because neural networks leverage matrix algebraic operations for processing, the input data needs to be in a matrix-like format for the operations to properly compute. This is possible for a small graph, say a single molecule. We could convert it into a tensor format that stores its built-in relationships, then feed it to a network. But what if we had a molecular graph with billions of vertices? A graph that describes interactions between millions of chemical compounds in precise ways. We can't efficiently store that many relationships into a tensor. It's too big. That's what she said. Stop. And another problem we have is that graphs have an arbitrary structure. They don't really have a beginning or an end. They're a bunch of values without a specific location in space. Two vertices that are connected to each other by an edge aren't necessarily close to each other. Traditional neural nets only really work well with structured data, like sequential text data, time series data, even image data, since images have structure embedded in them via pixel proximity. To solve these issues, a paper from 2009 out of the University of Wollongong, Australia proposed a graph neural network model, or GNN. They went on to demonstrate how, given a partially labeled graph G, a graph neural network could accurately predict the labels for the remaining data points. Their model learned to represent each vertex with a state vector that contains information about its surrounding neighborhood. To compute an output, the model then passes that state vector to a final output function. That first GNN proposal had a variety of limitations that have been worked on for the past decade, and just this past year, we finally started seeing them being used for real-world applications. So Michael Bronstein, the head of graph learning research at Twitter, saw my tweet that I'd be making a graph network video this week, so he slid into my DMs to suggest a few relevant papers for me to cover. So shout out to Mike. The one I liked the most that he suggested was his paper titled Hyperfoods, Machine Intelligent Mapping of Cancer-Beating Molecules in Foods. It turns out that up to 40% of cancers can be prevented by eating the right types of foods, which probably doesn't include Vada Bob's, unfortunately. I love you. They applied various techniques to the graph to learn representations of these medical terms. And then, once they learned these representations, they trained a model to classify the categories for the different types of medical terms. So whether it's classifying data like categories or generating novel data like potential drug candidates, graph networks are being used today by businesses and researchers to solve a variety of problems. Graph nets. Graph nets. Take the input of each node. Aggregate it with your code, yeah. Now look, I know what you're thinking. I want to build a graph network for world domination, but I don't know where to start. I got you.
Whether you want to start a business, add an impressive project to your portfolio, or just tinker around for funsies, there are several freely available tools that will let you do just that. The top three are the PyTorch Geometric Library, the GraphNets Library, and the Deep Graph Library. The PyTorch Geometric Library has the latest types of graph networks already built and ready to call as single line functions in PyTorch, which I absolutely love. The GraphNets library by DeepMind Research was made for TensorFlow. They really went the extra mile in terms of documentation and made a few collab notebooks to showcase how to use their graph network library to find the shortest path, sort numbers, and predict a physical system. But, and I say this as a huge fan of DeepMind's research contributions, this code isn't really beginner friendly compared to the other two libraries since the code isn't as easily readable. So I wouldn't start here. The Deep Graph Library, however, this one is my top pick for beginners. It was invented by the distributed machine learning community on GitHub, the same crew that released the popular XGBoost algorithm that won all of those Kaggle competitions. This library checks all the boxes, actively maintained, cross-platform, readable code, and so, so much documentation. All right, to get a better grip of how it works, let's use it to perform classification for our own toy example. Let's say we have a data set of 34 proteins in the form of a graph with the edges describing the types of biological interactions between them. More formally, this is called a protein interaction network. No steroids necessary. Protein zero and 33 are both related to a specific neurogenerative disease. We want to find the proteins most related to each of them respectively, which will save researchers time in further investigating the effects of these proteins on specific diseases. We'll first import the deep graph library in Python, then create a function that will build this input graph, and we'll define it as a graph primitive, which is built into the library. Since this is a toy data set, we'll define the values of the graph ourselves, first as nodes, aka vertices, then the edges between them. Then once we've constructed the graph, we can visualize it by using the network X library, the ideal for studying and visualizing graphs in Python. We'll choose one of its many built-in graph layouts and draw it. We'll now give each node a simple feature all at once with a single line of code that turns each node into a one-hot vector. Now we're going to define our graph convolutional network. We'll first import PyTorch because it dethroned TensorFlow. Then we'll define what a given layer looks like. During the forward pass, we first set the input node features, then trigger message passing on all edges, then trigger aggregation at all nodes, get the resulting node features, and perform a linear transformation to help it generalize from the data better. Clearly, this is a little different than a feed-forward neural network. What's happening here is that at each layer, each node carries a feature vector, and each layer tries to aggregate the features from the neighborhood nodes into the next layer's representation. This message passing paradigm is what's unique to graph networks. The nodes send computed data via message functions and aggregate incoming data with reduce functions. We can define not just one, but two layers. Then once we've defined the network, we can define a training loop where we optimize it the same way we do with most neural networks. Once trained, we can visualize the result with Matplotlib and we'll see that during the training process, it correctly classifies the network into two distinct protein classes. That wasn't so difficult, right? In fact, it was pretty simple. Let's make things a little more interesting with a coding challenge, shall we? Using the deep graph library, create a graph network that solves a healthcare problem, send your GitHub repository to me within a week, and I'll give the coolest project a shout out ne in next week's episode. Good luck and happy learning. Welcome to the end of my video. If you wanna see how deep the rabbit hole goes, hit subscribe. And thanks for watching.